say anything about the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What is the role and significance of the Holy Spirit is not known to Christians to that day. How do I know this? James has tried to paint a very simplistic picture of the church history. Everyone was in harmony. All the people believed in the Trinity. Look how clearly stated the Trinity is in the early writings of Ignatius and others. And that's not the case. If you pick up any history of the doctrine, such as J.N.D. Kelly's, you will come to realize that the picture was far from simplistic. It was very, very complicated. And most Christian church fathers did not believe in the divinity of the Holy Spirit in particular. Now why do I believe that? And if James was going to attempt to find his own definition of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible, this is a very important point ladies and gentlemen. You must note that James will try to find his own definition of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible. And I'll tell you why he cannot find it. And that's where the debate is lost. And I'm not going to decide whether the debate is won or lost. You will decide. But some of the major Christian authorities, even Catholics, believed that the divinity of the Holy Spirit is nowhere stated in the Bible. Have you heard of John Henry Newman? Anyone? John Henry Newman, Cardinal John Henry Newman, who was a Catholic Cardinal um, alive in the 19th century Britain. And he was one of the leading authorities on Catholicism in the country. Thank you. He states in his discussions and arguments on various subjects, published in 1899, page 114. Thus, for instance, a person who denies the apostolical succession of the ministry because it is not clearly taught in the scripture ought, I conceive, if consistent, to deny the divinity of the Holy Ghost which is nowhere literally stated in scripture. John Henry Newman clearly stating the divinity of the Holy Spirit, the third person who is also considered to be co-equal and co-eternal. I, even if I was to give James the divinity of Jesus Christ, no problem. I don't want to debate that. That's another debate in itself. Was Jesus God? And I am not debating that topic tonight. I am debating a very specific topic. That definition of the doctrine of the Trinity which is in your book, James, I want to see that definition entirely put down, stipulated in the Bible. Can you find me any reference, even a vague one, on the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit that states that the Holy Spirit is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Son? Any vague reference, according to some huge major Christian authorities, not that you are not one, Obviously, they disagree with you. So what was Origen saying in the 3rd century? John Henry Newman said this in the 19th century. In the 3rd century, Origen is saying the same thing. The apostles related that the Holy Spirit was associated in honor and dignity with the Father and the Son. But in his case, it is not clearly distinguished whether he is to be regarded as generate or ingenerate. Or also as a son of God or not. For these are points which have to be inquired into out of sacred scripture. According to the best of our ability. And which demand careful investigation. And that the spirit inspired each one of the saints. Whether prophets or apostles. And that there was not one spirit in the men of the old dispensation. And another in those who were inspired at the advent of Christ. Is most clearly taught throughout the churches. In other words. In the middle of the third century, one of the most learned men in the Christian world is saying, we simply do not know what the function and the significance of the Holy Spirit is. In 380, Gregory of Nazianzus, one of the three Cappadocian fathers, the champion of Trinity, or one of the champions of the doctrine of the Trinity, he states in a sermon, and he gave an illuminating picture of the wide variety of views which still held the field in the 4th century on the issue of the Holy Spirit. Some, he reports, consider Holy Spirit to be a force. Others, a creature. Others, God, with capital G. Others, making the vagueness of scripture, their excuse, declined to commit themselves. 
Of those who acknowledge his deity, some keep it as a pious opinion to themselves. Others proclaim it openly, and yet others seem to postulate three persons possessing deity in different degrees. James had a debate with one of our friends, Bassam Zawadi, whether Islam has misunderstood Christianity or not. That was the topic of the debate. In that debate, James came to the podium and he made a statement. He said that if the salvation of humanity is connected to disbelieving in God or believing in God, then it must be clearly stated. His view is that the doctrine of the Trinity is not clearly defined and stated in the Quran. So his request or demand from Bassam was to produce a statement in the Quran which is clear enough on the doctrine of the Trinity for us to either accept or reject it. I asked the same question, if the doctrine is so important for our salvation, if it's so important for our well-being in the hereafter, James, please come and substantiate your own definition of the doctrine of the Trinity according to the scripture. I want to see some passages on the Holy Spirit where it is clearly stated that the Holy Spirit, if it's a person, is God with capital G and it is co-eternal and it is co-equal to God the Father and God the Son. Please avoid preaching. You're an absolutely amazing preacher, no doubt. I give you that much. James White is an absolutely amazing, uh, amazing, eloquent preacher. Avoid preaching about the doctrine of the Trinity. Most Christians here have heard that for years. What we want to know is whether that particular definition you preach from is in the Bible or divinely stipulated or not. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, now the battle is joined, Adnan. For what is fascinating to me is that Adnan and his arguments against the Trinity are significantly more advanced and knowledgeable than the arguments of the Quran. And if the Quran is written 600 years after the days of Jesus, even if the Trinity is true or false, leave that aside for the moment. Did God know what the doctrine of the Trinity was in 632 AD? You better believe he did. So how can a person living in the 21st century produce a better argument against the Trinity than the author of the Quran did if the author of the Quran is God? Question you might want to think about. Where is the Holy Spirit described as God? Well, Adnan, I know I've given you my book on the Trinity. And there's a whole chapter on the Holy Spirit. So why didn't you go to that chapter and try to take apart the argumentation? Let's just think about a couple of them briefly. Acts chapter 5. Peter, Ananias, and Sapphira, they've been caught lying to whom? Read it carefully. They're lying to the Holy Spirit. But then when Peter says, you not lied to men, but to whom? To God. Interchangeable. But one of them that a lot of people don't catch, that I think is really important, is in 1 Corinthians. Because there, the Spirit gives the gifts to the body of Christ as what? As he wills. Now here is God giving supernatural gifts to the body of Jesus Christ. And they're given based upon the will. And the term that's used there in the original Greek is never used of an impersonal force. This is clear indication the Holy Spirit is a person. But he wills to give the very gifts of God to the, to the church as he wills. He's sovereign over that matter. Now, what type of sub-creature could possibly be sovereign over these things? Now, did people in the ancient church miss texts like 1 Corinthians and not see the relevance of it? And there might be, he was saying, some people teach this and some people teach that. Let's deal with the text. He says, go to the text. Okay, how about Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20? As soon as I quote that, in his opening statement, Adnan says, well, there are certain people that say that's not in the original manuscripts. Okay, Adnan, show me a single manuscript that substantiates your argument. Just one. I happen to know there are none. I happen to know it's a theory that has no foundation or backing up. And I just asked my Muslim friends, if I didn't like uh, what a certain text, Surah 4171, which basically condemns me to hell, let's say I didn't like that. 
And I just decide, well, you know what? I'm sure that there are some manuscripts of the Quran somewhere that don't contain that, so let's just not deal with that this evening. How good of an argument is that? It's not a good argument at all. We shouldn't be using that kind of argument. So even when I show you texts where clearly, if you're baptized into the name singular of three persons that are distinguished from one another, each one of them is described as Yahweh by the New Testament writers. Like I said, you can't understand the New Testament unless you recognize that it's being written after the revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity. Peter was an experiential Trinitarian. He had walked with the Son. He had heard the Father speaking from heaven on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He was an experiential Trinitarian. The New Testament, what, what Adnan just demanded I give is you need to give me your exact definition in the page of Scripture as if you can give me your exact definition of Tawheed and the various forms of Shirk and Rububiyah and names and attributes and everything else in the text of the Quran. You can't. Let's use equal scales this evening on that level. But I want to have the exact definition. What I told you in my presentation was, I am forced to my exact, my exact position in that definition by the teaching of the Bible. What are the three foundations? There's only one true God. We won't question that. Secondly, there are three persons who are distinguished from one another in the text of the New Testament. There's no confusion between them over against the modalists and people like that. And then the real issue, does the Bible then teach us that each one of those persons is co-equal and co-eternal with the other? Well, if they're each described as Jehovah, if they're each given a role in, for example, in the resurrection of Christ, the writers of the New Testament can easily talk about the Father raising Christ, Christ raising himself, and the Spirit raising Christ. They just can easily move him back and forth. Paul, for example, Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of Christ. Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of Christ. He, does, he doesn't even stumble in, in switching between these terms because the New Testament is being written by Trinitarians. They're not trying to explain it to one another. They're not trying to put forth a creed, though there are a couple places they get close. That's not the purpose of the New Testament. The only way you can make heads or tails out of that book is to recognize that it's being written by Trinitarians. Now, just a couple things that I wanted to get to. Uh, Adnan said that I'm trying to make it look like all the church is in harmony, and this was a simplistic presentation, but I hope you were listening carefully to what I said. That's exactly the opposite of what I said. It's exactly the opposite of the presentation I made. I recognize that there were people in the early church, some which didn't even have all the canon. There were all sorts of false teachers and things like that. I recognize that. We can't have a simplistic standard. I specifically mentioned that. And he mentions Justin Martyr. Well, take what Justin Martyr said then and take his argument that Jesus is Yahweh and try to put them together to figure out what he meant. Don't just take one part. Allow it to speak. Now, very quickly, uh, Adnan said that I had failed. Now, the funny thing is, 